Mm-hmm. Next speaker is Jim Andrews from the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, and they will be presenting Establishing Baseline Distribution Data on Vermont's Reptiles and Amphibians, the 2018 Maps and Species to Watch. So please join me in welcoming Jim. I'm probably the last guy who should follow Jason, really, on this presentation and talking about staying up to date with technology. I think we've recently come from about 25 years behind to maybe about five years behind. You know? <laughs> and uh, by the end of the year, maybe we'll get up to about two years behind. But we do have a brand new website. We have brand new maps. Uh, we have brand new interface. And, um, it, it is, uh, the Atlas is largely a citizen science effort in that I collect data from anybody who will give it to me and we review it. But the idea is to establish baselines on distribution of the reptiles and amphibians in Vermont uh, you know, at the beginning of the century, and we've been doing it for the last almost 25 years now. Um, there's not as many herpers out there as there are birds, you know? <laughs> and um, we certainly take advantage of all the iNaturalist data um, and, and get it into our program. But I want to show you any, I want to show you some of our maps talk about a few species, and uh, just have some fun with these critters. Um, so I'm starting out with uh, this species, and for those of you who uh, have, have forgotten the data that you once had about differentiating mink frog from green frog, which I'm sure you all knew at one point, um, you're looking at both of them right there. You're looking at mink here, and you're looking at green here, and you're knowing to look for, you know, dorsal lateral ridges, but the stripes on the legs are telling you, hey, green frog, versus the spots on the central portion of the leg with the axis going up parallel to or along um, the bone rather than across. So mink frog. Mink frog, northern species. <coughs> One reason, <coughs> the primary reason I want to talk about mink here. So for something like... Uh, a green frog, um, the, the unit that we're trying to get data on is the town. Though we certainly get far more accurate data in terms of location than that. But we now have gotten to the point where we have photo documentation of the green frog from every town, city, and gore in Vermont. Which I think is just fantastic. Okay, green frog, okay, we kind of expected, you know, that it would be in all those places. But now we can, we can show you that. I want to get to the point where any conservation commission can get to me and say, what do we have in our town? Here it is. Or, you know, uh, the Cisco National Wildlife Refuge get in touch and say, what do we have in the refuge? You know, I said, here's what we got, you know. Um, and we do a lot of that. Um, but look at the S. This is the, the first point I want to make. Those guys, these guys, bullfrogs, um, we don't have a long enough summer for them to mature. And so the tadpoles have to go through at least one winter before they can metamorphose. Maybe two, depending on the length of our feeding and growing season. Um, but they've adapted to that, so there's no hurry for them to lay their eggs early in the year because they're going to go through a couple winters anyhow. So they can wait and start calling and mating later and lay their eggs later when the water is warmed up. And if the water is warmed up, it has less dissolved oxygen. And if it has less dissolved oxygen, how do you get the oxygen to all the eggs of those thousands of eggs that you laid? Now, if you laid clump like this, it would be hard to get the dissolved oxygen into the center of the club when you have a, a limited amount of oxygen available. But these guys that breed late, like that one, spread it out as a film on the water. So it's not a round mass. And so it's easy to get oxygen to all those eggs and allow them to develop. So they lay late and they spread their eggs out in a film. Um, just giving you some dates. This is late. I mean, for, for a frog, you know, wood frogs would have been calling two months earlier than that. So these guys are really late in the season. So those critters, those frogs, which lay their eggs either earlier in the spring, <coughs> cold water, or 
further north or higher at elevations can afford to have rounded masses. Wood frog, northern leopard frog. So a mass like this. So mink frog has a rounded mass. So it also lays its eggs fairly late in the season. So it's got to be where the water is cold. It's got to persist up there in the northeast corner of Vermont because it's laying its eggs late. That water's got to stay pretty cold all year in order to get oxygen to the center of that mass. And so that's why I pick on this one to begin with. If we're talking about climate change, this is a northern species. It's actually a Canadian species primarily that just makes it down into this corner of Vermont as opposed to other species which we may see move up into Vermont from the south. This one may well get pushed out. What you're looking at here with these, these are historic records. We're just using a standard that uh, any record that's more than 25 years old is historic. And if we haven't replaced it with new records from those towns, then we have to map it as historic. We haven't, we haven't gotten any new records. So that does suggest when you're looking at this northern creature that maybe it's disappearing from some of those towns already. But I got to take you back and say, this does not necessarily mean that we went to each one of those sites where this species was collected 30 years ago and double checked it. We haven't. I mean, we don't, we don't have the people, we don't have the knowledge out there to go double check all those sites. We've checked some of them. But I wonder, and, and we had a presentation earlier this morning about water temperature, I wonder that as the water temperature here continues to warm, whether this species will be unable to successfully develop and breed, just producing fewer and fewer young. Now, is that the limiting factor? Maybe, maybe not. It could be competition with more southerly species like bullfrog that move up into its habitat. It could be disease, you know, different diseases that, that could survive in the warmer water as opposed to the colder water. That could be a host of other potential variables that could drive that species out from the north. But I want to show you that one and just one of the sorts of variables that climate change could have an impact on. And, and we might see this species eventually disappear. Um, I love that shot just because it shows typical habitat, old barn, old garage. Um, a lot of Vermonters, a lot of local Northeasterners used to call this, and, and many still do, the spotted adder. Um, but its most recently updated name, common names are changing uh, over the years, is Eastern Milk Snake. That's, a, that's fairly new within the last couple of years, Eastern. Um, but I want to show you that particular critter. And I showed um, at this meeting last year a variation of this, but I just think this is so freaking cool. I mean, if you look here, you look at 4B, parting this zone 4B, and you look at where that is, and then you look at the distribution of this critter, you know, and you go, huh, pretty well limited by climate. It sure looks like it. And, and so then you wonder, well, well, why would it be? Okay, well, first of all, most of the snakes that survive well in northern climates are one small with a skinny body so that they can heat up fast. So if they get cold, they can just follow the sun around, bring your body temperature up. A, bit, a heavy bodied snake would have a much harder time here heating up. So that's an advantage, just follow the sun around, heat up. Second thing that's a concern to the snakes is that most, most of the snakes that do well this far north are live bearing versus egg laying. We have both. And so if you're just dropping your eggs somewhere, they need to be incubated by the environment to the point where they can hatch and get out of there. Whereas if you've got your kids inside your body, you can just move around where the sun is. As the sun moves, you move. You don't have to have a nice warm spot. And, and finding those nice warm spots is why uh, that milk snake is, is near 
uh, your barn or your compost pile or uh, you know the manure pile for the barn because it's generating heat incubating those eggs you know so this is an egg layer but then there is there's an in-between adaptation which is pretty cool if you're an egg layer that lays that, that survives in the north you retain your eggs you just keep them in your body longer which is pretty much the same as giving live birth you just keep them in your body until they only got about two weeks to go and then you put them out in the environment and you hope that we have that two-week window in July or August, wherever it's warm enough for them to hatch. But I'm already getting people. Now I, I don't have the kind of data, the robust data for herps that you know that I'd love to have. But we get the anecdotal stories from you know people up here that say, you know, I've lived here 40 years. This is the first time I've ever seen this snake. What the heck is it? And you go, you never seen a milk snake? Weren't you ever a kid? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I walk into a diner up in Brighton. And you see the corner guys over in the corner having coffee. And you go over and say, hey, guys, you ever seen this thing? What the hell is that? You know? And they haven't. They don't, they don't know that snake. And, it, and it's really kind of interesting to see that you get up in here, it's only a three-snake corner, three species. <laughs> and you get down in here, and you're up to ten, you know? And it's not a lot of distance there, but there's a lot of climate difference. And, and so I wonder, a snake like this, whether we're going to, See, this kind of stuff. That's a jump. But, you think about those jumps. You're moving the old car around. You're moving the hay around. You're moving the manure that you're spreading around. And all those things are ways for us to move individual critters or eggs. Um, frequently, um, it's compost, uh, mulch, um, nursery plants, well heck with nursery plants, we get stuff from Florida. Or they brought their boat up. They had their boat shrink wrapped in Georgia and brought it up to Vermont and opened it up and out popped a lizard. I mean, we, we have ways for these species to make jumps like that. Could they do that on their own? I don't know. Uh, given with the amount of fragmentation that we have now and the amount of busy roads we have now, that's quite a, that's quite a leap. But I can't, you know, we have a five-line skink, a lizard, has shown up at boat access areas well outside its range. That seems like a bit of a coincidence. A boat access area, and uh, somebody just brought their boat over from Lake Champlain or something like that, and, and the skink got out. Or Grandpa has an RV in the yard. He came up from Florida, and we got a fence lizard that shows up. You know, so it really seems... Like we're moving stuff around on the landscape other than um, them moving themselves around. I'd like to show you Decay's brown snake um, just to look at its range and think about what we know. Champlain Basin. I mean, look at that. I mean, we still have stuff to learn about what's going on in these places. This is the Winooski River Valley. Okay, that makes some sense. Lowland species, floodplain species, that kind of stuff. Different places it's showing up. Um, and then coming up here, say, in Huntington, up to Winooski River Valley, and then up the Huntington River until you get into that nice valley in Huntington, and you look at how it's spreading up, and you wonder, is a species like this going to be moving up north in elevation and out of the current valleys? Or is there not the habitat that it needs there? It, that that what it really needs is the floodplain, and despite the fact that it's getting warmer, there is no habitat for it to go up. You know, it can't it, it can't do it. Can it compete where it is? I don't know. Great tree frog, one of my favorite critters. Um, advertising its toxicity. Um, don't lick them. <laughs> I have occasionally made the mistake of handling an injured gray tree frog and rubbing my eyes. It'll burn for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then you'll be able to see again out of that eye. It's a little scary, you know. You would think a person wouldn't do that more than once, but some people have. <laughs> you know? um, but if you look at the distribution of gray tree, it's kind of a... Oops, no, you don't this. All right, egg mass. It lays... <laughs> It lays its eggs later. Fewer eggs, but a film. Right, because it's warmer. 
and it does develop in one year. So different sort of distribution and it's only missing for, I kind of think of this as the Southern Cross, those that are familiar with the, the, the maps of Vermont, these are high elevation cold towns in Southern Vermont, right there on the, on the uh, spine of the Green Mountains. And so these are all higher elevation places. And it's interesting if you do, if, if it's some June night before a thunderstorm, you start here, you drive up and over the mountain and drop down there, you hear them calling, 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 you hear nothing, and you drop back down into them. You know, missing from the higher elevations. So, is that a temperature thing? Are they going to move up? Is that a habitat thing? I mean, does it have to do with deciduous, deciduous growth? Um, frankly, I don't know. But it's, a, it's another species where I'm hearing the same sort of anecdotal information that it was with the milk snake. I'm hearing from people that, hey, I've lived here for 20 years and I've never seen this species. What the heck does this thing crawl on the window? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great tree frog. Is it going to move? I don't know. Boreal chorus frog, at least that's what we think it is. In 1980, when the first regional guide was printed uh, for reptiles and amphibians of the Northeast, this species was not even included. They didn't know about these records of boreal coarse frog from northwestern Vermont. We, in the 80s, were able to find some populations, a few, by uh, 1999, one population, I really shouldn't call it popular two frogs, <laughs> since 1999, zip. This is a northwestern species, you know, at the southern extreme of its range. So that's one where, that we could see changes in soon. And this one has disappeared. Uh, we can't, we can no longer find the species. Is that climate related? Could it be? Could be. In that this is a lowland ephemeral pool breeder and being Sudacris, it has a lifespan of maybe three years. If you're a spotted salamander and you have 10 drought years, you're still living. And the 11th year, you get water at the right time because you've got a lifespan of 25 years. Mama still comes back, gives it a try. She could survive that. But if you live three years and you've got three bad breeding years where the water wasn't there at the right time, you're out. You're done. Now, is that what happened? I don't know. Was it a change in farming techniques? Is it a new farm chemical? Is it Roundup related? Don't know, I wish we knew more. So, um, just some of the cool maps that we've, from varying from those where we've really filled things in on American toad, down to those where that's the habitat, we don't appear to have any other habitat, that hasn't changed. Five Line Skink has not moved. So, to give credit to where the credit is due, uh, please go to our website, please report what you see. Um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Little Hack Foundation, and this organization have been a major funder of this work for the last 20 years. Thank you. time for probably one question. One question. No pressure, just better be a damn good question. <laughs> <laughs> All right.